Welcome to the session on insulin signaling science and policy. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Daniels. I actually am not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. I don't do anything except study policy, uh, which is the part of the panel that I will be talking about in brief as well as the rest of the panel. Let me just do a brief introduction before we get started of our panelists, uh, many of whom you probably already know for some of you in the audience. But uh, immediately to my right is Dr. Richard Feynman, who is a professor of biochemistry at SUNY Downstate, which I just think of as Brooklyn. I don't know why they changed the name. Uh, and to his right is Dr. Eugene Fine, who is a professor, a professor of clinical nuclear medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And following up on his right is Dr. Judy Wiley Rossett, who is a professor of epidemiology and population health, uh, as well as a professor in the Department of Endocrinology, also at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So today, our topic is an attempt to address the issues that come together between the latest research in insulin and insulin signaling and some of the ideas that are coming out of the science and why that is seemingly out of step with policy and hopefully we can perhaps address what might be done about that. So the format of today's session will be fairly simple. Each of the panelists, each of the three panelists to my right, will speak uh, very briefly about some of the science in the cutting edge science and where the science has been and where it's gone. Uh, and then we will each, uh, and I'll prompt them with a very uh, brief question here. And then after that, we'll have brief answers on some of the policy issues. And we're hoping, and as long as I'm doing my job as moderator, we will have lots of time for questions from the audience for the panel. So let me begin then with the first question. So several dec decades ago, the federal government undertook making specific nutritional recommendations and guidelines that encouraged high levels of carbohydrate intake and reduced fat and cholesterol. A conflict emerged at the time between the science and the desire for some federal policy. In 1977, when the McGovern Committee met and made its recommendations, scientists and doctors who were at these hearings objected and called for more research to be done. Uh, in particular, Dr. Robert Olson, uh, many of you have probably seen the video of him, called, quote, for more research on the problem before we make recommendations to the American public, uh, to which Senator George McGovern uh, said, I would only argue that senators don't have the time or the luxury that a research scientist does waiting until every last shred of evidence is in. 35 years later, with literally thousands of studies and detailed research having been pro uh, produced, the shreds of evidence seemingly are now a mass of evidence, unfortunately largely in contradiction to what the McGovern Committee has recommended. So the question for the panelists to begin is where does the science seem to be right now? What do we know about insulin and carbohydrate and fat consumption? And what are the cutting edge issues in research today? So we'll begin then with Dr. Richard Feynman. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I, would, I think that the reason that uh, the school is called Downstate rather than Brooklyn is so that the uh, state legislature does not have to admit out loud that it's funding something in New York City. Uh, <laughs> focusing on where the science is on insulin signaling, the most obvious place to look, <clears throat> I think, is on diabetes, which is the most obvious manifestation of insulin signaling. And uh, I think it's a relatively simple science because all we need to look at is epidemiology and three studies. First, the epidemiology. During the epidemic of obesity and diabetes, the increase in calories was due almost entirely to carbohydrate. Uh, what you're looking at here are the NHANES data on absolute uh, energy. These are actually, uh, these are actual uh, uh, calories on the left uh, side. So the percentages uh, of fat went down, but for men, the absolute amount of fat also went down. So the increase in calories was due to carbohydrate. Experiment one is an uh, experiment from Gannon and Nuttall, and they have a low-carbohydrate diet, and the key word, uh, the key phrase is weight maintenance diet, and you can see much better uh, glucose uh, control, much, 
uh, improved insulin control and a reduction in hemoglobin A1C. This is a 20 percent uh, carbohydrate. So glycemic control does not require weight loss. Everybody knows that weight loss will improve diabetes, but you don't need it, and it's pretty hard to lose weight. The second and third experiments refer to a low glycemic index diet, with J which Jenkins compared to a high cereal diet. And uh, almost the same day, the same number of uh, subjects, and uh, very similar uh, experimental design, Eric Westman uh, compared a real low-carbohydrate diet with a, a low-glycemic index diet. And uh, the results are uh, pretty clear. Uh, the, uh, the red is uh, Eric Westman's low-carb diet. And the bottom line is that the low-carbohydrate diet is better for just about everything. And the low-glycemic index diet uh, was better than a high cereal diet. So uh, experiments two and three show you that a low-carbohydrate diet is better for weight loss, glycemic control, HDL, and triglycerides. The key point, though, is that not every question in science requires a long-term uh, trial. Not everything is up for grabs. You don't have to try everything. Uh, in uh, diabetes, uh, you have a disease of uh, carbohydrate intolerance. And these uh, four studies bear out uh, the principle. There's no long-term study that has contradicted any of the results. Similar results have been found at uh, one year, or depending which things you uh, uh, expect. Most of all, you've got to use uh, more than statistics. You've got to use some common sense. There's nothing in the design of these experiments that says you won't keep getting the same results as long as you keep doing it. And related to that is the low-carbohydrate diets have better adherence than anything else, sometimes better than adherence to drugs. So that's uh, my take on this science. OK. Thank you, Richard. And we'll now have Gene Fine. I'm going to try, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to try to keep this as uh, simple as possible, and, and some of it will, of course, uh, overlap with what Richard's saying. But um, and forgive me if I appear to be reading some of this because I'm trying to keep it into four minutes. But uh, the first uh, issue is that where are we? Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently, I have the wrong controller. They look the same. First is that insulin is the central regulator of both carbohydrate and fat metabolism. Okay, we need to remember that even though the food pyramid has been abandoned, most Americans still consume about 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrate. 90% or more of these carbohydrates are simple sugars or starches that digest sugars. And the final pathway of these sugars turns out to be glucose in our blood and in our cells. Second, it's glucose, not fat, which is the principal stimulus for insulin secretion. So it's carbohydrate in the diet that's driving insulin secretion. And then insulin turns around and it pushes glucose and fatty acids into our lipid cells to form stored fat in the form of triglycerides. Furthermore, just to add insult to injury, insulin inhibits the breakdown of fat. So to summarize, we're now in a position to summarize all of this and to recognize that insulin is what makes us fat, driving glucose and fatty acids into fat cells, stimulating fat synthesis, and it keeps us fat, inhibiting the breakdown of stored fat. I uh, should mention that um, 
the commonplace wisdom, you are what you eat, it's very catchy, it's very convenient, it's also wrong. <clears throat> Our biochemistry just doesn't work that way. We have to understand that drinking a glass of pure fat drives no hormone comparable to insulin. We can't identify a single hormone comparable to insulin that has that role. Remember, cows get fat eating carbohydrates, tigers stay lean eating protein and fat, and humans are omnivores, which means who knows what they do. And the only way to know what they do is to find out what they do, and I just told you. So, the growing scientific evidence supports reducing the excessive insulin secretion that high-carb diets have produced in the population. Just to sort of take that into a little bit more detail, it's becoming increasingly apparent that low, the low-fat paradigm, the food pyramid, have resulted in an epidemic of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and lipid disorders, all consistent with the result of excess insulin secretion on overdrive due to excess dietary carbohydrate. It may turn out that this is overly simplistic to associate all the diseases of civilization with insulin, but at present it's certainly not unreasonable to examine whether reduction of insulin secretion ought to be a public health dietary priority based on the best available science. There's nothing about this that's new either. Human biochemistry certainly hasn't changed in thousands of years, and even the description of what we know about our biochemistry hasn't changed in at least the 40 years since I've been in medical school, and certainly longer. It's possible that dietary steps to reduce overall insulin secretion may reduce the incidence of coronary artery disease, stroke, kidney disease, diseases of the eye and retina, obesity, degenerative joint disease, hypertension, as well as the observed increased risk for cancers, which now exceeds the risks due to smoking from obesity and hyperinsulinemia. So from a scientific point of view, the evidence continues to accumulate that reducing the effects of insulin signaling would possibly be of enormous health, uh, public health benefit. Thanks. Thank you. And now Judith Wiley-Rossett. Thank you. I'm going to be going through, we, had, we are focusing on a series of questions in both parts of this, and I'm going to be uh, highlighting some of the questions that uh, were approached by the American Diabetes Association in coming up with its recommendations. Where's the science right now? Uh, recent research has provided insights about the intricate functions of fat tissue in relation to insulin resistance and its comorbidity. So that's been a heavy focus. And Dr. Fine talked a little bit about some mechanism related to this. What do we know about insulin and carbohydrate and fat consumption? Weight loss and modifying the amount and type of carbohydrate can reduce circulating insulin levels. Reducing total calories also has been associated, and increasing physical activity have been associated with reducing insulin resistance. What are the cutting edge issues? I, my own personal view is that epigenetic research and the effects of nutrition on DNA methylation will hold great promise. And I think that uh, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of looking at historic diets and the paleo diet in relation to evolution. And I think that epigenetics is gonna be very helpful in that area. But it's, it's at its infancy right now. Uh, this slide is actually uh, an examination from one, one way of looking at the evolution. And basically, before the Ice Age, basically, uh, the diet was potentially fairly high carbohydrate. And with the coming of the Ice Age, there may have been a breakdown into, and this is actually probably grace, greatly simplified, but there may have been a group that had a higher carbohydrate with a lower glycemic index in one area where uh, the, there was less impact of the ice age, and in uh, another area where there was uh, greater, a lower availability of fruits and vegetables, then there would have been more consumption of meat. Uh, as a, a logical, and uh, the availability of nuts were probably higher in the area that had the higher vegetable. 
and in the, that we do know that there are at least 100 different genes involved in diabetes and about 150 genes involved in obesity, so that it's not the gene. We used to look for the thrifty genotype. Now we're looking at what combination of genes. And then we basically uh, have the westernization of diet, and that was thought to be uh, the availability of taking the Pima Indian population, putting them on reservations, giving them a high-fat, high-carbohydrate diet with lard, uh, a lot of processed grains, and uh, a lot of cheese and making them very sedentary, unlike their counterparts in Mexico who were very physically active, consuming legumes, nuts, and vegetables and fruits. And then there was the high carb, high, higher carbohydrate diet with a higher glycemic index uh, in the European population, but they may have been less sensitive. But any population can become vulnerable, but there is also, a, we're starting to study the healthy obese are metabolically healthy obese, which is an intriguing population. Uh, and then there are also the lean, metabolically unhealthy, and what combinate, what are the difference of the combinations of genes in those two groups? And that may yield some valuable insights for the future. But we do have an obesity, of epi uh, an obesity uh, epidemic, and we're moving toward uh, a diabetes epidemic. And basically, this is just a simplistic diagram of what happens in that obesity is affected by both uh, energy intake and uh, physical activity. And we create ins local insulin resistance, and we have an excess of uh, triglycerides being formed. And they are first deposited probably in muscle tissue. Then there's a related inflammation then there's a spillover into the liver. And there's been relatively little discussion of fatty liver at the conference, but I think that's an area of great concern uh, in terms of long-term health risks for people with diabetes and for children as we see an increase in the obesity epidemic in children. And this is just a projection of diabetes from uh, Africa, we're going to see the greatest percentage increase, but because it's starting from a low level, by 2025, it'll still be low. But we look at the Western Pacific on the far side, and we see uh, incredibly high prevalence. And India and China are both very worried about that, how they're going to handle the treatment of kidney disease related to diabetes. And that brings me to the Diabetes Association conclusion in terms of uh, looking at obesity as a risk for type 2 diabetes. And basically, the evidence level is considered high that a low-fat, Mediterranean, or a low-carbohydrate diet can be effective for two years. And this is an area where I, uh, Dr. Feynman is going to raise an objection, but the, an E-level evidence is that a low-carbohydrate diets need monitoring of renal function and protein intake in those who have nephropathy. So if you have end organ damage, there would be a reason to monitor protein intake. Uh, and I think there's been universal agreement that if somebody's on uh, hypoglycemic medications, either insulin or sulfonylureas, that you need to monitor the glucose. I think where the controversy comes up is monitoring lipids. And we maybe need a caveat saying that high carbohydrate diets need to have triglycerides monitored. And maybe that's where he should put his energy rather than fighting the whole statement. And physical activity and behavior modification are important parts of weight reduction. And there's, that's level evidence B. The largest trial of weight control in type 2 diabetes will be finished in 2014. It uses, it's the look ahead trial. It uses a low fat diet in combination with physical activity, and there has been about an 11% weight loss. So we will find out what the impact of that has been in about another year and a half. Thank you. So, so uh, we move now from the science, which is the sort of very quick version of the science, to the policy. And the prompt that we've come up with for this part of the, of the uh, session is as follows. 
So one of the biggest challenges, as we've seen from some of the research to our health and our health policy, has been the rates of increasing degenerative disease uh, brought in, uh, about in part from uh, faulty dietary recommendations. There's no doubt that the surge in some of these uh, pathologies were not just accidental, that there are very coordinated uh, timing between when some of the policies were adopted and the increasing rates, which, didn't, which never increased before at that, uh, at that level. So along with the recommendations, a whole system of policy has developed to go along with simple dietary recommendations. Nutritional uh, funding, government research, agricultural subsidies, policies uh, that encourage certain selection bias in the medical literature, uh, interest in, special interest in Washington, et cetera. The question then is change. How do we make that change and why is it so difficult? So given that researchers in the fields have sifted and winnowed through the evidence and are now trying uh, or are arriving at different nutritional and dietary recommendations, the question is where can we go to improve? Should the goal simply be a new set of recommendations that advise people more specifically on the cutting edge of science, or is there a better way? Can uniform policy solutions, one policy solution across the board, give us uh, the path to better health, or is the ancestral health movement better to avoid such policies and work as it does right now from the grassroots up? So to answer this question, we'll, we'll proceed through the panel once again. First, Richard Feynman. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, discuss my uh, take on what the problem is and what the uh, potential solutions are. Let me start with uh, the answer, tell you what the solution is. And uh, this just appeared on Medscape. It says there's a new government commission to streamline diabetes care. Two U.S. senators introduced an act uh, to ensure a thorough review and uh, quotes uh, Alan Garber, head of the Endoc uh, Endocrinology Society, saying, doing nothing or even doing more of the same will not reverse the arc of worsening diabetes prevalence and complications. So uh, what can you do? Uh, well, you should talk to your elected officials, uh, all you guys out there. Um, encourage the uh, creation of the Diabetes uh, Commission and tell them that they need to hear from all of the sites sides, particularly uh, uh, paleo side, the low carbohydrate uh, side, and they've got to fund meaningful research, research where uh, all of the people uh, are uh, involved, and all the sides agree that it's a real study. Uh, the Look Ahead trial was started by people who were looking ahead uh, in their direction, but not in my direction. Let me say that, that uh, this is serious. Your elected officials, uh, uh, your uh, senator will, will uh, meet with you, or at least their aides will meet with you, because that's their job. And they're interested. They obviously have uh, uh, numerous other inputs, uh, but they are seriously interested in the problem, uh, possibly because they're on statins, and if you can drag that in, uh, may help. So here's the, uh, here's the problem is that we, we actually know a lot, but there's a kind of disconnect uh, between the science and the society. This is from uh, the F uh, Food Navigator, which is a house organ of the food industry. And it says a growing body of research has suggested that replacing fat with carbohydrates is going to increase the risk of heart disease, but people keep looking for uh, low-fat foods. And uh, it's not up to the industry to uh, sell people what they uh, can't sell. Uh, it's up to us to change uh, uh, the guidelines. So the question is, is there a state diet? And uh, the USDA has uh, put out their state diet. Let me give you a take on this from uh, Obama, who says not many Americans would feel comfortable the government monitoring what we eat. Well, of course, that's not true. Uh, all kinds of people are, uh, seem to be comfortable with uh, all kinds of uh, recommendations or uh, uh, attempted interventions. Not all of us are comfortable with that, however. Uh, uh, I uh, 
previously mentioned that we had uh, uh, provided a critique of the USDA guidelines. The editor of the journal uh, wanted to know in brief what our problem was. I said that they make uh, drastic, uh, very detailed recommendations in the face of contradictory evidence. So he said, well, make that the title of your review. Uh, so we did publish a review in the face of contradictory evidence. Uh, the USDA has not responded to that. And uh, we were... Uh, the merest amateurs in uh, headlines. Uh, the uh, uh, New York Post came up with Fed's food fog. <laughs> and it's not just the USDA. We have governments that we haven't elected, uh, like the American Diabetes uh, Association. And I I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Wiley Rosset for actually willing to uh, uh, take on her critics, unlike the USDA, who just couldn't make it. Um, the, um, this says diabetes risk may not go up from a low-fat diet. What? Who said that it could go up from a low-fat diet? So uh, this is uh, a remarkable uh, redefining of uh, reality or something. I don't know what. Uh, the Reuters' take on this was that while the low-fat diet craze led some doctors to worry that Americans would instead start eating too many carbohydrates, a new study suggests the low-fat craze, is that what it was? Uh, is that what it is? Uh, we're just getting uh, mixed messages. So this is the... Uh, one of the guidelines that uh, Dr. Wiley Rosette mentioned, and uh, they did a systematic review. The uh, problem is that, that their uh, system didn't include uh, what I considered to be, uh, what I gave you as an example, of one of the four main backbones of scientific evidence on diabetes. That wasn't in that systematic review of macronutrients. Uh, they did have another review uh, the uh, argument was they had picked an arbitrary number of uh, subjects, but uh, in fact, uh, without going into uh, detail, uh, they did it wrong. But here's the real thing which uh, Dr. Wiley Rosette mentioned. For patients on low-carb diets, monitor lipid profiles. Now, I've described this as devious. I'm not suggesting that the authors are devious. This is a devious statement. What it's trying to say is low-carbohydrate diets will give you cardiovascular disease, okay? Because that's been the uh, a mantra of the uh, establishment for 40 years, and if they think that, they should come out and say it. But they don't uh, say that. And the level of evidence is, in my view, uh, only characteristic in medicine. Most scientists don't know about these. Level E, I think, means th is the lowest level of evidence and means that the information was on a piece of, uh, was in a newspaper that somebody found on the subway on the way to the meeting. In fact, it doesn't increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. If anything, it lowers it. Uh, all of the markers that we have, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, uh, uh, total cholesterol, these all are improved. We tried to offer a, uh, a different point of view with 24 authors, some of whom are head of endocrinology uh, centers. Uh, the di uh, diabetes care uh, was not interested. So there's the solution. And uh, I think we have to give it a try. It's not easy to write even a uh, short email to your senator, and it takes a lot of messing around to figure out how to write a letter to anybody else's senator. Uh, but I think we know that there's uh, a problem, and uh, uh, I think this is the way to get at it. Thanks.
Yeah, I, I, I generally feel sort of uh, pretty helpless when it comes to the idea of understanding how to, how to influence policy. So what I'm really going to talk about is really just an anecdote of my experience with what the effects of policy have been in a very narrow example. Uh, I know several endocrinologists that treat diabetics, and several of them have told me that they treat diabetics with calorie-restricted low-fat diets, and they also treat them with carb-restricted diets, they say, because both work. And I guess if the patient actually does stay calorie restricted, it will work. So they say, but they have more trouble keeping the patients on the low carb diets. And so this is kind of a, an amalgam of the conversations that I've had with these endocrinologists. And um, the, the question then came up to me, I said, well, how do you keep your patients on the low fat diet? I say, do you, do you have, do you refer them to a dietitian? And they say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, refer them to a dietitian. I say, oh, okay. I say, do you do that for your low carb diets, patients? And they say, oh no, there aren't any dietitians trained in low carb diets. <laughs> so somehow that might have something to do with, uh, with why they can't stay on the low carb diet. There's nobody reminding them what to do, telling them, so here's a book, go figure it out for yourself. And um, you know, I say, well, do you monitor them? He says, well, I don't have time. So this is the effect of policy, and I think until policy is actually able to change what dietitians learn, what uh, they're able to affect in, uh, in their patients and how they're able to help them, uh, this is what we're going to continue to see. So uh, I'd agree if we can somehow influence our elected representatives uh, in some way and tell them to, uh, to look at uh, all sides of this issue, uh, we'll do better. Thanks. Again, I started with the, uh, this one time it's four questions, and where can we go to improve? And I actually had the experience last week, or a week and a half ago, of being asked to testify uh, on the sugar-restricted beverage policy It was being considered by the Board of Health. And the borough president for Brooklyn, not the Bronx, uh, testified that he didn't want anybody telling him what to do and that while he put his whole borough on a weight reduction diet they volunteered to do that and he didn't want the um, city of new york or the mayor in particular to tell him what to do and then there were the teamsters came out and testified it was going to affect their profits and the soda beverage companies actually i testified for the heart association and my position was it was worth piloting, but we needed to evaluate what the impact was because there could be unintended consequences. So again, I think we need to consider the calorie toxic environment that we live in. And I'm gonna focus pretty heavily on the sugar sweetened beverages. Should the goal be a simply a new set of guidelines uh, or should we scrap guidelines together? And we need to consider the government's role in agriculture and food supply. The development of the dietary guidelines is because the government is already involved in food. The government has agricultural policies that subsidize certain crops, they don't subsidize other crops. And the school lunch program, which started in 1946, was because, ironically, so many soldiers in World War II were undernourished. Of course, what they did is threw cowries at them. And so that the, the McGovern Commission was partially to try to help rectify that. They did probably go too far one direction, but we need these sort of corrections that we need to develop. Do we need a uniform policy? I think we need dynamic policies with an evaluation feedback loop. And I'm a big uh, advocate for using a systems dynamic approach or simulation modeling in which you get all sides in and you look at it because then you don't have opinion weighing it. You can keep putting other things into the model saying if we make assumption X, this is what happens. So we make assumption Y, this is what happens. And I think it actually helps in keeping us all more objective and keeping our biases and our emotions uh, reduced. And the, the fourth question, should the ancestral health movement avoid policy work and work for the grassroots? Grassroots work efforts are in, need to involve collaborations and cooperation mm -hmm. to consider policies that maximize benefit and reduce negative consequences. And I think that looking at where there can be partnerships, uh, advertising of candy and sodas to children is one of my pet peeves. 
and this is showing the price of food and as you see the upper line is fresh fruits and vegetables they have increased most dramatically uh, carbonated beverages have not changed in their price fats and oils uh, and sugars and sweets have uh, increased slightly but fresh fruits and vegetables is where the most dramatic increase in price has occurred and that may also apply to lean meats and some things but this is showing the prevalence of type 2 diabetes between 1933 and 1997 with the increase in per capita consumption of corn syrup. I don't need to explain this to you. It's pretty evident that little uh, solid dots are the increase uh, in consumption and the vertical bars are diabetes. And that trend has continued. This actually is looking at corn price supports and the increase in corn syrup consumption and that occurred in about 1957 and whole grains whether you think that we should be having more or less whole grains has went down in that same time period and the commodity price support is basically that we support sorghum barley rye oats and corn production outside of the outside of a commercial corn area with a 70 percent uh, parity and it's been projected that corn farmers may actually make more money in the drought this year because they're being paid what the parity price would be and another unintended consequence is as our corn production in NAFTA has driven the Mexican form, uh, corn producers out of business so that they're not having local corn, they're now having imported American corn. So there are a lot of unintended consequences for things that are not even seemingly agricultural policies. And uh, this is a slide looking at the effect of, and you could choose any legumes, uh, protein-based food based on, this is soybeans, and this is the relative production in terms of meat. I lived downwind from a hog farm as a child. It is not pleasant. And I'm focusing on not on uh, sustainable agriculture. I'm, so f I'm focusing on farm factories. And I've lived down to wind from chicken farms as well. And basically the land use, water requirements, fossil fuel requirements, phosphate rock, and emissions, uh, there are countless unintended consequences in terms of the environment when we try to produce meat rapidly. And the last slide is actually from the dietary guidelines focusing on these concentric circles. I think we need to have this set up not in concentric circles, but circles that intersect with each other and to really look at what the potential effects of policy are. Thank you. So now that we're at the policy part and we don't have to worry about me speaking out of turn on science that I don't actually understand, or at least only grasp from what I learn, uh, I'm going to close the panel and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I am a historian and economist, so I don't do the medical policy, but uh, building off of what Judy has said, what I wanted to focus on was one, the rather disappointing fact that we can learn from history, and then two, to end perhaps on a more positive note. The disappointing fact is when we look at this, as historians and economists and political scientists look at the problem of agricultural subsidies, at government recommendations, uh, we have to look at the long picture. Where did these policies come from? Why did they come about? And then obviously what some of the unintended consequences are. But when you look at the policies as they exist today, one of the biggest problems that uh, is difficult for people to understand is how in the world something like 800,000 farmers can extract somewhere between 10 to $30 billion a year from the American taxpayer every year. Why are they getting such a high rate of subsidy and yet have such a small, minute fraction of representation in the overall population? This costs, of course, all of us money not only in the form of higher food prices and, and subsidy prices. Uh, corn literally is, is triply subsidized. They subsidize the growing of the corn, they subsidize the marketing of the corn, and they subsidize the sale of the corn when those price supports don't match. They have ethanol programs to, to pull the corn in as well as the sugar market. Uh, and the question ultimately comes down to actually something that was talked about on the first day uh, on the panel about uh, uh, the seeds of our discontent panel. And the problem is, as the public choice school would explain it, there is a distributed cost 
to these programs, that is that we all pay for them. We pay a very small amount, but there is a very, very concentrated benefit. The farm lobby, as it's called, has very, very powerful interests and can affect this policy. And as was noted in some of the panels yesterday, only, only very recently have people become aware of the annual or, or regular re-up of the farm bill. Typically, this just passes and, and agricultural senators and representatives support the po policies that support them. But again, the question is, how can such a small number of people affect such a, a major, major policy that has all of these spillover effects? Well, the reason is that this concentrated benefit gets them much, much more bang for their buck than it does the rest of us. If we all could coordinate a popular grassroots movement to try to overturn the farm bill, Right, to, to convince, if we wrote to all of our senators, if we wrote to all of our representatives to try and convince them to not uh, pass the next farm bill, to end agricultural subsidies, which would be a great policy, uh, it's likely that the cost of doing so for all of us in time and in resources would far exceed what the cost is in at least nominal terms to the average person. If you're only paying five, 10, $15 more for your food every year, but you would have to pay $500 and say 40 hours of your work in order to overturn that, it's very simple to see that the person might choose simply to have the bad policy at a lower cost. And it's not the farm lobby alone. The farm lobby has, uh, has favors that are done, or at least it has allies in urban areas in the form of the subsidization of food programs and SNAP and WIC, the food stamps programs. It has allies in the education lobby with the school lunch program. There are interlocking problems here. And if one just stops to consider where many of these policies come from, it's really daunting to think that we can end them or even start to reform them. Just consider the subsidization of sugar. Right, which I know Lustig is talking about in the other room, which I appreciate all of you coming here to listen to us. Sugar has been officially subsidized to the tune of some billion, uh, two to three billion dollars a year to the American consumer, has been subsidized since 1816. This is not a new policy. These are, these are very, very old rooted policies. So the question that I want to ask in terms of the where do we go from here, that's, that's a very daunting reality to face. Uh, there are numerous, numerous policies that are interlocked into the cause of some of these problems. But my recommendation is the following. I don't have specific recommendations about which committees you can write to and which policies you can try to change, but I have a recommendation about how you can make those arguments. Because I think that there is one overriding fact that we, uh, the ancestral health movement, can take advantage of. And that is that we can have the moral high ground. We need to argue for the idea that the government shouldn't be dictating these policies to us, that freedom is the better argument. What we need is to remind people that what they put in their bodies is as fundamental a choice as their reproductive freedom, as their religious freedom, as their freedom of speech. It is fundamental to who we are, to who we become, and to the health consequences that we have, and that people should have that kind of freedom. We need to make the case that markets can solve these problems, what Rob Wolf was talking about, that people can actually figure these things out and that we can work toward better policy, in a sense, in a distributed grassroots way, that people will see the evidence of better solutions and adopt them voluntarily much more readily than they will by adopting them as a matter of government uh, influence or government policy. What we need to do, in a sense, is to advocate like we have a separation of church and state to have a separation of science and nutrition and state. And that, I think, will ultimately be the moral high ground that we can take to win this argument in the popular mind, to remind people that it's their freedom to make these dietary choices, to figure these things out for themselves, with, of course, a healthy dose of non-government influenced, non-biased science, so that we can have a debate and so that we can figure these things out. So that's my recommendation in terms of what we can or how we can argue. Uh, I think many of you know that the what we can argue, of course, will emerge from the science, will emerge from the researchers that are at this conference, and many uh, also from, from the grassroots, people that are figuring things out for themselves. But we have to remember to keep that moral high ground, that we're advocating for something that's in people's interest, freedom. So I will end there so that as moderator, I can say that I did my job and had time for questions. So if there are questions for the panel, please uh, come up to the microphones. Uh, and we have, uh, I think we started a little bit late, so we have uh, perhaps not quite as much time as I had hoped, but some time for questions. Um, this is... Uh Quite an informative uh, session, uh, as far as I could see. Um, 
the, the topics are quite, are quite broad and, and complicated. Uh, policy and science issues have always been integral to the, to the nature of the nation. Um, I agree, I think the science from my perspective with, with, with respect to insulin and, and food choices and this thing, I think the science is pretty solid. Uh, I, I think that case has been made very clearly at this, I'm very impressed the first time I've been to this ancestral uh, health uh, symposium. Uh, I, think, I think they're on, they're on target. Um, the word has, is getting out gradually. The policy issues are, are always going to be problematic because there's big, huge amounts of money uh, associated with these particular policy changes. The pharmaceutical industries, the healthcare industry, to, to embrace the concepts of the Ancestral Health Symposium could have massive financial repercussions throughout the nation. There will be gainers and will be losers. So uh, the question is how can everyone uh, be a, somewhat of a winner? The, sci the science is solid. Uh, the reason why we don't move forward is we have merchants of doubt, uh, we, whether you consider it as climate change, ch uh, insulin role in diabetes, you know, uh, we remove the smoking uh, to, uh, we have people liver living, living longer and now they have diabetes, they become a cash cow for the pharmaceutical industry. You get 20 more years out of a, a, a diabetic than you would out of a smoker. There, 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 is, there is massive financial repercussions to the health care system. How do you change the policy so that we can have a healthy population and have the federal government feel good about it without the input from all of these other teamsters or whatever you want to, it's very, very complicated. But I think it, has, it may arise, as you said, from a grassroots, uh, because I'm convinced the science is solid. I don't think we need any more research. More research just muddles the situation even more. It's clear. The question now is policy and how you go about it from the grassroots or from the top. And that's where the challenge has to come. Well, my suggestion was that your elected officials will listen to the uh, grassroots. Uh, and I, th I think the problem is that uh, there's very strong uh, competing uh, inputs uh, from lobbies and official health agencies. Uh, but if you don't fight with that, if you don't try to get your input in, uh, you know you'll lose. Yep. But uh, it's, worth, uh, it's worth the effort because my limited experience with my elected officials is that they understand the problem and they, uh, uh, one in particular said, give me one page of uh, uh, information that I can use if the question comes up. Now what he meant is that the question is not gonna come up unless five other people come to him and the senator, uh, the other senator from that state says he had 20 guys in his office. Then they'll listen, uh, and and they'll only listen because they understand the problem. Uh, they are in sympathy with the science. Yeah, I, I think that I mean you raise a very interesting question about the about the interest that you know if you if you propose to the pharmaceutical industry to the farm lobby to everyone that if if overnight these subsidies were ended and the whole cycle really because it is a cycle it's a cycle from the subsidies for growing and then the the health pathologies that develop and then the treatments for those pathologies and the, the whole system but th there are literally billions of dollars of costs and and if if you project out what that's costing the United States government uh, and what what that's costing the American taxpayer in terms of not I mean it's it's a really vicious cycle we, we spend billions of dollars to enter into the system to create a certain situation, which then costs us hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, for, we go from tens of billions of dollars in subsidies to ultimately hundreds of billions of dollars in healthcare costs. Right? As Rob Wolf put up on, the, on, on his slides the other day, the, the increase in health costs has been almost, uh, it has been primarily driven by the pathologies that have been talked about today. And, and so the one thing that I would recommend, and, and that I would recommend, and I know some people disagree with this, but I don't think that taxing sugar or banning soda or, or doing these things is really ever going to be an effective way of doing that. That's a very dangerous uh, tool to be using. It's a knife that cuts both ways, so to speak. Because uh, as we've seen, when the wrong science, or, or when mistaken science, or when, when policy rushes ahead of science, takes that same tool 
it can have very deleterious consequences. And so for us to simply say, well, but if we got the smart guys in the room to, to write the recommendations or to, to control what people ate, uh, we have to be, that, that's a lot of trust that you're putting in the smart guys. I think that, that advocating uh, a reduction in cost for all of us, ultimately, because of that vicious cycle, is the way that you can convince people that it's a win-win. And even though certain companies or certain lobbies may, may lose out, uh, th there are more of us than there are of them, in, in population at least, uh, if not in, in bankroll. <laughs> Next question. Hi, my background's in economics and public policy, so I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, I'd also point out that there seems to be a persistent pastoral myth about how agriculture operates in this country. And it seems to me that a big part of the problem is that the other side is kind of dominating the conversation in public. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can kind of fire back and kind of get our side out there. I mean, writing to your senator is a laudable goal, but I don't think it's gonna really change anything. And I've got a poster in the hallway. Just oh, like all right. Well, terrific. Uh, yeah, the, there, that is an interesting question. I mean, how many of you in this room? Uh, well, maybe in this room, probably there will be more people that would would know and believe this. But how many of you in this room know what the average uh, demographic makeup is of a farmer who gets subsidies? I mean, this has been sometimes in the media, and sometimes there are exposés about this. But m many many of the highest rates of subsidies uh, for agricultural lobbies are paid to people who have zip codes that run between 10016 and 10021. Right? That, that's New York area, right? And Manhattan even. What are, what are people in Manhattan being paid farm subsidies? Well, they're, they're, they're of course, uh, landlords. They own farms. They're people being paid for farm subsidies who literally have not grown. I mean, everyone knows about the, the old New Deal programs paying people not to grow on their land, but they've actually had land that's been converted that can't be grown on. It's not just lying fallow for this season. It's land that literally has been taken out of cultivation. Trees have been planted, and people are being paid for not growing or, or for uh, increasing production in other land in order to not grow on that land. The problem is that these are not small American families, right? Most of those 800,000 that I mentioned that are receiving farm subsidies are people that are receiving the farm subsidies, uh, large, uh, typically associated with the, with the major agricultural uh, businesses, ADM, Cargill, uh, ConAgra, et cetera. Uh, this is not the mom and pop farm that, that the kids are helping out you know, by going and plowing the fields. Uh, these are uh, multi-thousand acre farms with, with satellite imaging of the, of the uh, water content of the crops, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can help uh, develop this. Uh, in a sense, this is, uh, this is what we have from this policy, right? That, that you encourage people to get these subsidies, well, they'll find more and more efficient ways of, of gaining these subsidies. Cracking that pastoral myth might be a way of convincing people that the farm bill, you know, if you actually look at who's receiving the benefit and remind people of that and remind people that it's not the small farmers, Right? It's not Joel Salatin. It's not the farmer that I drive to you know, 30 minutes from my house. It's, it's major farms that don't have farm stores, that don't sell their products to the American public. Uh, if we can remind people that that's who is getting the subsidies, it becomes a little bit easier to, to break through that myth, I think. Uh, actually, there's a huge diabetic uh, community out there that is self-treating each other because what the doctors tell them to do, uh, low carb, I mean, low fat, high carb is not working. And I hang out on these diabetic forums and they're huge. There's one that's got 300,000 members. And what they're doing is giving themselves advice on uh, what to do it. And of course the advice that works for almost all of them is low-carb eating. And they are coming away from their doctors not only ignoring what they're saying, but laughing what they're tell, being told because they know it doesn't work. Now, these, these, uh, this is a huge group, and it's growing bigger day by day. And I just wonder if academics should get involved in some of this grassroots movement in an educational mode. I think that one of the things that's concerned me that I, I've been here is that people make an assumption that the American Diabetes Association recommends one diet, and it's a diet that's, and that's, it's been 25 years since that's been the recommendation. And I think that look for your allies. And the statement that I showed that they basically look at it, a wide variety of macronutrient diets have been t tested, and there's been no recommendation to 
not follow a low carbohydrate diet. So I think that rather than, and I, one of my concerns in, in terms of the Diabetes Association is that the recommendation is that people start medication the day they're diagnosed. And I think there are a lot of patients who develop diabetes who don't want to do that. So I think that we need to look for your allies, not to try to create enemies. Well, uh, let me uh, speak to that because I suggested to uh, Sue Kirkman, who is a uh, spokesman for ADA, that they were much stronger on what they were against, namely low-carb diets, than what they are for. And she said, yes, that was a reasonable uh, criticism. You can't say it's okay to go on a low-carb diet, but get your lipids checked. In other words, it's okay to go on a low-carb diet if you don't mind having a heart attack. It's devious and... Uh, you know, we want to be polite here, but it's bad. It's wrong, and you are the enemy. And when I suggested to one of these uh, uh, diabetes groups that I thought uh, that I thought uh, I thought that the uh, nutritional board of the American Diabetes Association was compromising all of the good things that the organization was doing for people with diabetes, I got a flood of people coming back saying they didn't do anything for me. Uh, it's, it's not uh, just the critics, it's the grassroots who are angry at uh, the American Diabetes Association. And I sent Sue Kirkman a, a statement from a woman who uh, uh, lost her eye following a high-carb diet given to her by an ADA uh, uh, spokesperson. Uh, this was a, a health provider, a diabetes educator. and. Uh, when she went on a low-carb diet, things got better. The, the ADA is not facing the facts, okay? Uh, you know, we want to be polite, we want to be collegial, but there's a, a large army of people out there with diabetes who see them as the enemy, absolutely see them as the enemy. And uh, I, I think uh, th uh, there's a problem, and uh, it, it is true that uh, there's slow acceptance but the slow acceptance and the statements from the uh, ADA have been way out of tune with the science. And, uh, you know, tell, tell me that if you say a low-carb diet's okay, but check your lipids, not check your lipids for every diet, but check your lipids on a low, tell me that isn't an intent to dissuade people from trying a low-carb diet. Well, uh, so as moderator, maybe I, I can be the voice of moderation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, let me, we, we're, we are just increasingly running out of time, so the people that have questions, please, if, you, if you'd like, stay around so that you can ask the questions. I'm sure the panelists would be happy to answer them. But let me just, uh, as moderator, I guess I'll take the privilege of having the last word. Let me just say two things. Number one, uh, as a try, a, a, trying to moderate, both of these solutions can work. The ADA is not, uh, I, at least as far as I know, I mean, they, they may be behind step if, if Richard wants to agree with that or not, but they will look at what people are telling them. They're not, they're not just ensconced in an ivory tower uh, handing down recommendations. They, they do take account of these things and they do research. So please advocate to them, but also it's important. Uh, you mentioned some of these forums and ways that people talk to each other. Uh, this just brings up a point because I want to get in a plug in the last, in the very last seconds here. Uh, the, the case that many of you are probably familiar with of Steve Kuski in North Carolina had a, had a blog that, that the state of North Carolina, uh, because he's not a licensed dietitian, uh, had been going after him. Please uh, support other organizations that help people help people remain free to advocate such things. So the Institute for Justice, I have a lot of friends that work there, it's a public interest law firm in, in Washington, D.C., has taken on his case and has agreed to represent him in his fight to be able to advocate uh, the kinds of things that actually worked for him. Uh, there are organizations that do this, that are open to feedback and open to uh, what people are telling them uh, and will be more open if more people tell them. And, and, but there's also the grassroots and that has to be protected. And so when you advocate, don't think that just writing your senators and representatives is the only solution. Don't think that just working from the grassroots is the only solution. There are so many facets of this problem, from school lunches to agricultural subsidies to dietary recommendations. Use your expertise. Use what you know to help fight this fight so that everyone ultimately can benefit, so that there is a win-win situation. Because if we're all healthier, and if we all save billions of dollars, trillions really, of dollars a year, uh, from making these changes, uh, we'll all be better off. So thank you all for coming. Uh, as I said, if you have more questions, please stick around. We're, we're happy to answer them.